I am extremely grateful to be here today. This talk is dedicated to all the young Latinos and Latinas out there who dream of becoming scientists, to those who want to use research as a tool to cause social impact. I want to encourage you all to dream big, to do what you love, and to follow your passion wherever that may take you. Most people perceive viruses as silent, invisible killers that cause epidemics and pandemics worldwide. Yet viruses are only invisible to the naked eye. Advances in microscopy have allowed us to observe what viruses look like in three dimensions. But if we want to dig in, if we want to visualize the details of the components of viruses, we have to open up our toolbox and combine virology with biochemistry, biophysics, and all the techniques in structural biology. Over time, we have learned that viruses are composed of the same building blocks of living cells. But unlike cells that use their proteins to perform all the functions that either keep a cell alive or eliminate a cell that is sick, viruses use their proteins to hijack the cellular machinery so they can reproduce themselves and continue infecting other cells. So it's no surprise that viral proteins are the current targets of our antiviral therapies. However, viruses like HIV are capable of modifying these proteins over time, which can cause patients that are in single antiviral therapies to become resistant to treatment. So scientists have begun looking for an alternative target, something that is so essential to the survival of the virus that it cannot change rapidly over time. And that could be RNA. RNA is like the cousin of DNA. They're both made out of similar building blocks. They both carry genetic information. But for the most part, RNA is like a message from DNA that has been translated in a language that the cellular machinery can read to produce a protein. But what's important here, what makes RNA an alternative target for antiviral therapies is its structure. Unlike DNA, which is only found in double-stranded helices, RNA has the ability of folding itself into complex structures, and these structures themselves perform functions that are essential for the cell. So some viruses have up taking RNA as their genetic material and use it not only to carry their genetic information, but also to use the structures within to co-opt the machinery of the cell. It's been known that some viruses that use RNA as their genetic material produce a specific ratio of proteins, and maintaining this ratio is absolutely essential for the survival of these viruses. It was also known that there was a piece of RNA that had the potential of folding into a knotted structure, and this piece somehow regulated this ratio. What we didn't really know was exactly how. And that's exactly what I've been doing during my PhD. I've been using a combination of structural and functional approaches to understand not only what this structure looks like in three dimensions, but how is it that its structure determines its function. The structural approach that we use in our lab is called nuclear magnetic resonance. And this tool allows us to obtain atomic information so we can create three-dimensional models of how molecules look like in solution. In order to understand the relationship between structure and function, I use something that we call structural guided mutagenesis. And what that means is that I change different regions within the knot structure to understand its function. I want to know what the contribution of that region is to the overall function. So by studying two different viruses, viruses that belong to very different families, a coronavirus that infects humans and has caused epidemics, and a retrovirus that infects mice but is used as a model system to study HIV, we observe that these knotted structures are actually found in a dynamic equilibrium between two states, and that each of these states has a particular three-dimensional structure. We also observe that these states are not found at equal proportions. One of them is found at a minority of the population. 
In the case of the retrovirus, it's somewhere around 5%. In the case of the coronavirus, it's more like 15%. But what was really striking for us is that these percentages correlate to the relative quantity of proteins that are produced. And so what that meant for us is that the state in which the RNA is found determines its function. For example, if the cellular machinery encounters the first state, the cells are going to produce one set of proteins. But if it encounters that alternate state, that state is somehow going to trick the cellular machinery into producing an extra set of proteins. And those proteins are necessary for the virus to create a new viral particle that can then go ahead and infect other cells. So by splitting the percentages or partitioning the amounts of the two states that are found within the cell, the virus can obtain a specific ratio of proteins. If we're capable of finding molecules that target this knotted structure, we will be able to create drugs that decrease infectivity. The results of my PhD are now the results that are the basis for a project in our lab that is trying to understand how this process functions in HIV. And it is our hope that in the near future, the results of our work will lead to the development of a new generation of antiviral therapies that can decrease infectivity and better the lives of people around the world. Thank you.